is the marginalization of dalits in india going up or going down are dalits more empowered today than they were in the past and which way will india's vast dalit population vote in the 2019 general elections joining us at the india today south conclave i want to introduce first suraj yangde he is a phd uh, at howard university studying at the kennedy school he is also taking classes he is the first dalit phd at howard Af at from an african university welcome with us also pallam raju senior congress leader and krishna sagar rao because i want to start by asking suraj about whether you feel that the condition of dalits in india is getting better is their marginalization decreasing or is their situation getting worse just about 2 days ago rahul um, a 10th grader a dalit girl sujali jato was returning from a school and on her way back uh, two rogues uh, stopped her poured gasoline petrol on her and burnt her alive again a day ago in bead a dalit boy and a non dalit girl were in relationship and married and she was and he was hacked to death in broad daylight if this is indicative of something uh, we are talking about the retrograde policies and thinking of caste existing in each other's mind who's sitting here because caste has become a mechanism to endorse one's superiority and if someone poses a challenge to that you witness a brutal violent death so if and again since independence if you look at it caste has been central to formation of india's republic five cabinets five cabinets and there was no adivasi sitting in the congress three nehrus one shastri and one indira gandhi there was no adivasi involved in the cabinet so this is the kind of a casteism we have inherited and we continue to to parade around in everyday circles in our conversations and caste today has been relegated to one nasty thing of reservation or merit the entire dalit humanity is not been in concern when we talk about caste the second thing an urban or semi urban or rural person will say is oh they got this free loading reservations and that's it nobody knows what lays underneath what lays beyond and of course dalits have been confined as an electoral coinage no one looks at dalit as a human as a fellow indian it's always to look and calculate them as someone fitting into the numbers of electoral politics krishna sagar rao the dalits of this country are increasingly more literate than they were in the past they are seeking to assert themselves and when they do there is a violent backlash of the kind that we saw in una we saw that with rohit vemula respond to suraj's opening comments about how the political class looks at the dalit community as a vote bank and not as individuals with specific requirements aspirations and needs that the political community needs to look at rahul i think uh, this discussion is not political it's more social and uh, the roots of this issue also lie socially i think it is drawn completely even away from the independent india but once we got independence till today no matter who was uh, you know in charge in terms of the government they have done everything they could to ensure that the rights are protected for the oppressed class whether it's reservations whether it is uh, atrocities prevention acts laws or whether it is representation in people's act with reservations in contesting so that they can be well represented so the measures have been taken so i'm not going to get partisan on that whether it is congress janata party or bjp we have either got this into the play or continued them as a government now coming to the continuity of atrocities on dalits it's very sad it's heartbreaking but i don't think what is being reported is exactly what is actually happening it could be even under reporting and sometimes it could be even over reporting so the perception which is being built today is more political than actually social okay so let suraj respond to this that in 5 years there's been one una there is one 
Rehut Rohit Vemula who committed suicide. And that cannot be held as a reflection of how India is treating its Dalits. The political class will allege that this is being done by vested interests for fulfilling their own needs, catering to the Dalit vote bank, as an example, to feed the factor of marginalization as opposed to looking at how Dalits are more integrated and are better educated and relatively speaking better off than they were. Yes, there is a problem, but you have to see where India and the community is coming from. India carries this shameful guilt and they should be ashamed of them that they send one Dalit every day to clean your own shit. We can't stare at our own shit for two seconds. Raise your hand anybody here who can stare at your own shit for more than five seconds. But we have treated our own Indians to get into the sewer so they can clean your shit and so we can live in a very sanitized India. One Dalit dies in sewer every five days. Is that what we are talking about? When we talk about atrocities, these atrocities are mentioned and he, the gentleman next to me is saying it's been sometimes over-presented. If you talk about the social or educational aspects, Narendra Modi government has not released 10,200 crores scholarships meant for scheduled caste students. 2,300 crores scholarship meant for scheduled tribe students. And in addition to that, the reservation that we all parade about, there is no filling of vacancies. The Central University Teachers Association recently, it's in the news, 50% of the seats are not even fulfilled. And when we talk about this, the whole notion of meritocracy has been plundered upon them. In addition to this, when we look at the teachers, less than 1%, 0.83 Muslims teacher, female Muslim teacher are teaching in our universities or our colleges. Dalit, Dalit, Dalit faculties are close to 5%, Adivasi too. And when we say this disproportionate, the people who identify themselves as upper caste Hindu, and this is a record of all India higher, higher, uh, higher education survey of 2016, 70 percentage of our faculty, 70 is upper caste Hindu. Now, if this is a representative of India, then we are definitely talking about a casteist India which doesn't educate its student. And even in the political as well as media discourses, we don't talk about this. Palam Raju, this is a very compelling argument I want you to build on that reservation per se, and you've been education minister, means nothing unless you work the back channels to ensure that there are people who are capable of benefiting from that reservation. At the IITs, for example, so many of the seats reserved for scheduled castes go are begging because there, is, there are very few students who can apply, there are very few who can get through, and there are even fewer who can stay, compete, and last out the whole term. I mean, let me start from the original question and uh, the social issue that we are trying to address. The Dalits have been a community that have been historically oppressed across centuries. And I think uh, once the Republic was formed, we did try to rectify the wrongs through various means. And I think it's been the attempt of successive governments. The reality in India today is we live in several layers. And I think there are parts of the country where those historical biases are still there. Manual scavenging still happens. Dalits are still uh, victimized. But I think if you, if the original point of the question is, are Dalits a better lot today? I would say yes. Because they are much more informed, they are much more organized, they are much more cohesive, they are much more assertive in, uh, in uh, you know, establishing their rights, especially the enlightened lot. But uh, there are uh, biases that still exist in society. And I think they are reflected in various parts of our, uh, okay, you know, Suraj, respond to this. I think yeah, Alam Raju to, makes an important point. No, one second. I want, you, I want him to, whether he accepts or rejects the assertion that given where we are coming from, Dalits are more cohesive, better organized, more empowered, and therefore less marginalized than they have been at any point in time in millennia. See, Mr. Raju's comment is oxymoronic. First, it says that Dalits have made progress, and on the second, say there are biases. How do we account to this? Either there has to be a progress without bias, or there has to be bias without progress. It's not a binary. There is relativity involved. I agree with you, Rahul. So when, when, when we engage, let's say, when Dalits are being organized, and you know, they have no other option. And what this current or previous political dispensation has done is, they have relegated, they have withdrawn the Dalit humanity completely, and they have made a tokenized political class. 
And because it's a tokenized representation that we see, we have, and it has become a this discourse that Dalits have been doing well off. Record says not more than 3% Dalits graduate with a university degree. When we talk about IIMs and IITs, these institutions, for example, IIMs have been made autonomous, meaning the director is the boss, the director is the king, you can take the decision the way you want. And IIM, shamefully, all the IIMs have not admitted any Dalit or Adivasi student into its doctoral program, which is called FPM program. In addition to that, and there's no record to that, and when we look at the faculties of the 496 whatever faculties, overwhelmingly, only 25 to less percentage belong to SCS obc which is close to 85 percentage of the population. Palam Raju, respond to this very powerful argument about tokenism. You know, a Dalit as president, the likes of Suraj will allege, is tokenism. A Dalit as minister, people will allege is tokenism. That it is not genuine empowerment because you need to ensure that a message doesn't go out that they are completely out of the power equation. You will find one Dalit and put him in a position of power to send the message to the, to, to the Dalit community that hey, we are taking care of your needs. It is not genuine empowerment. You are accused. The political class is accused of tokenism. Uh, I will definitely like to concede to that point that there is tokenism in politics, not only to the Dalits, but you know, to certain uh, categories of people. But having said that, I think there is a genuine intent to uplift the community. And uh, uh, I think Suraj has been specifically uh, addressing the issue of the faculty positions not being filled by Dalits. You know, I think Suraj, you must also acknowledge that we live in a competitive society. I'm not saying that there aren't any biases. There certainly are biases across uh, institutions, across uh, strata. But I think when we are talking about institutions like the IITs and IIMs, there is a point beyond which you cannot compromise in the quality of the faculty that you are trying to draw. I am sure that there are brilliant people in Dalits who are out there uh, and I think it is a question of finding that match or that person wanting to be a That's a, a good faculty. point. He has been education minister. He says, you can't force me to make as IIM faculty someone as professor who's not qualified to teach financial analytics, cost accounting, pick any subject, unless he knows what to teach. Whether he, just because he's Dalit, he can't be given a job. That's why we are saying, incorporate them into the system, get them into pipeline, get them into the doctoral programs, and institutions, as a state institutions, have responsibility to go back to the community, try to elevate and try to target it's not going to happen within 50, 70 years of independence that Dalits who have been outcast and wretched and humiliated and degraded will suddenly one day become the director. We have to follow the procedures. And of course, if you look at the record, if you go to schools and IITs, IITs have been cesspool for the Dalits. IITs have not been encouraging the so-called institutes of national importance. And as a matter of fact, 26,000 plus suicides happen, not only Dalits, but students across within the institutions of higher learning. So if this is any indicative and not necessarily only Dalits, that means education institutes are not empowering students to think creatively. We have a very Brahminic system where the idea, where the professorial staff is not the Dalit. Your, uh, your support and mentorship is not Dalit. I was in Gandhinagar recently, and a Dalit is afraid to own him or herself up. They are just afraid. You can be a Brahmin and you can be proud, you can be a Muslim, you can be X, Y, Z, you can still own it up. But no. tell me in public discourse how many Dalits just could but, come but, but up, let's, own it up. But let's see, Suraj, what happened when a Dalit got an opportunity to become chief minister of India's biggest state. She went and built statues of herself. That's not something to be proud of. When you get an opportunity of a kind which no one from your community has got for centuries, you go and build your own statues. How is that empowerment? How is that bringing... Uh, Dalits and members from your community into the pipeline. Well, I think she built statues, but she also built four universities. I think the kind of progress that she has done and she has ushered the kind of confidence, I think the development projects done by, for example, Mayawati has not been as focused as much as she holding a purse and building a statue, that one monument. And similar when we talk about the Statue of Unity and you know, the whole Chinese labor being deployed, same argument is not applied here, when in fact the labor and the whole project was done with this indigenous labor. And so what I'm saying is we are still casteist in our own approach, where we try to find loopholes, there is one crack, there is one fissure, and then that's it. That's the representative of everything. Rest of the work, which could be a swath of ocean, is not being discussed as positive. When Mayavati builds her own statue, it is a problem. When the BJP spends 2,800 crores buying a statue, building a statue, mostly made in China, 
then it becomes a big problem. Say you're comparing apples and oranges because a uh, statue of unity is an icon and uh, building your own statue while you're alive is a different story altogether. Now, my friend here, Suraj, I don't know no, where he is. No, but you must respond to this, Suraj. Mayavati building her own statue cannot be compared with Modi building a statue of Sardar Patel. I mean, Modi had his, I mean, not him, but the temples are built of Modi's, you know, people worshiping him. We have the news out where, we, you know. No, but Modi didn't build his own temple. Right. So, Mayavati built her own statue and so, spent hundreds of crores doing so. The point is, when we talk, and we have to look at this also in woman empowerment, first of all. She is a Dalit woman, and Dalit woman is the most wretched and degraded being, you know. A statue of a Dalit woman being paraded openly is just not, is just not sitting in the conscience. This Dalit woman is actually, if not her, is being raped, is being, is been undergoing torturous regime. And, and many Dalits have said this as well, Krishna Sagar Rao, that having Mayavati statue there is a sign of empowerment. You know, if there had been other Dalit women before her, you could have said, okay, why didn't she build a statue of somebody else? But who else is the one Dalit woman she could have built a statue of? And many in the Dalit community think of that statue as a sign of empowerment. In the heart of Lucknow, in the capital of India's biggest political state, you've got a statue of a Dalit woman. That by itself is empowerment. I really wish the people of Uttar Pradesh could have built the statue of uh, Mayawati instead of she building with public money. Keeping that aside, the rationale behind Suresh's argument falls flat because he's trying to defend even the indefensible. He is not even saying that that's wrong to do with the public money and then go on with the Dalit cause. So what happens here is you're trying to justify things just for being acrimonious, being angry. Your angry needs to be justified. It should not be misplaced. I completely understand that. This is a good anger. point. And we, and we saw this very recently in uh, Agenda Arch Tak, which we had in the capital this, this week itself where we had this young man, Chandra Shekhar Azad, he's now dropped Ravan from his name, he just seemed like a very angry young man. And the BJP spokesperson has a point that the anger needs to be channelized. You know, you can't just be angry because I'm angry, that anger needs to be channelized. And while he was very angry, how channelized was that young Dalit's anger? It depends on how we define anger. Is anger spooing hatred? Is anger divisive? Or is it an anger of sympathy and empathy? Is it an anger that is extension of a love? It's a caring love that we see through this anger. And anger is not necessarily negative when it comes from the oppressed person. It is an anger, it is an anguish that is convincing, that is trying to make its case. And if you're not going to listen to us, our anger is going to come out. Take it or leave it. You're going to see it either on streets, or either, on, uh, either of the spaces which are occupied. Krishna Sagara, when you dictate dietary choices, when you impede economic imperatives of the Dalit community. When you tell them what to eat and what not to eat, you are pushing that anger. You are, te you are foisting upper caste dietary choices on India's Dalit community. If at all you are talking about uh, anti-cow slaughter laws, it is not we who have made the 1964, it is the Congress which has brought in the anti-cow slaughter laws. But we will be, uh, you know, stoned for it and Mr. Suraj will not take two words to do that. Uh, See, Mr. Suraj today speaks so eloquently and so graciously with anger, of course, and the anger is justified. But how did he come here? I don't know where he studied, but if he's saying that Dalits didn't get empowered, now he's a, he's a symbolism of Indian Dalit empowered. No, but he's he's, now I, I think that's a facile argument. He just told you 3% of the Dalits managed so to complete education. No, that is why and I'm the saying. Ambedkar went abroad and studied way back in uh, the early part of the last century. No, it's all right. I'm, I'm not saying all of them no, are empowered. You can't just because he's educated, I'm, he's at Harvard and Rahul, therefore what about any? Rahul, what I'm saying is, don't completely strike down the patience, persistence and what the Indian nationals have allowed the affirmative action to stay. No. We did not question an untimed I'm sure everyone sitting here would have noticed when he doesn't like a question, he just sidesteps it and pretends he didn't hear it and answers a completely I mean, different question. I mean, the question is, one second, I, I why sorry. is the ruling dispensation foisting upper caste dietary choices on India's Dalit community? We didn't. That's the answer. We didn't and we never will. But I am telling you once again, this country has been behind the affirmative action without being time bound. We never question the timing of reservations no, or timeline I, I, I of reservations. This, question this entire the, nation Baba has Sahib standing beside Ambedkar Dalit brothers in, in, and we, um, we want the them idea, to be empowered. The idea was that this would be time bound possibly for a decade. You empower Dalits and then you end reservation. 
you know, I'm sure a majority of the audience uh, sitting here in Vizag is upper caste. And I'm also certain that most people watching would be upper castes. And all of them would say, how long would reservation last? You know, this can't be done permanently. And while it is absolutely correct that, uh, you know, we want to empower Dalits, upper caste meritorious students will think that this is very unfair to them. As a PhD fellow, how long do you think we should continue with reservation? For as long as untouchability exists in this country. In Delhi alone, there was a survey done, and in UP also, close to 60 percentage women and men folk acknowledge that we freely practice untouchability. 39 percentage. What said, survey are you talking about? 60 percent of Delhi. This, this is this is an economic and political weekly. 39 percentage of them said. No. Some of people we know. That's a publication. What sub survey is this? The, the, EPW is a EP, publication. Yes, and in, in that the survey was done by uh, three scholars, which is available on the internet. As long as untouchability exists, I, I find as long that as a bit bizarre. Sixty percent of Delhi is telling you they believe in untouchability. You just look up. I'm, I'm just not making this up. I can provide citations and all. Well, let's keep that side, this argument for the side for the fact check. How long will the reservation last? For as long the caste system exists in this country. Tomorrow, make a project of elimination of caste system. Make sure that the the people who how, are being, how do we do that? How yes. do we eliminate the caste system? First of, I mean. Ambedkar has indoctrinated that into annihilation of caste. He has mentioned that where the sources of castes, from where the caste emerges, has to be dismantled. Because here, the ideas of Shastras have been so sacrilegious that people are afraid to even take a call that this could be something we should acknowledge and work towards it. And by the way, Ambedkar did not envision it for a decade. It's, it's very mis misinformed. I had posted it that he was, he was of the same argument that the, the, uh, the reservation should continue for as long as the people are still not empowered, right? What that means is, still we are unhappy with no, some but why section should, of Dalit. One, one second, one second. Why should, the, why should your son get into St. Stephen's or SRCC? Because he's a Dalit. If you've been to Howard, he has absolutely no business. If he gets through because he's your son and he's cracked the exam and got the numbers, absolutely by all means. But right now, and 20, 30, 40 years later, I don't know if you have a son, so I don't want to uh, comment on that. But how is that fair? Wow, he still gets car, he still gets the benefits of reservation. I think Raul, again, this goes to the very grain of escapade, meaning the people that we see around us becomes a representative of the entire reservation system. Meaning, if we have seen, let's say, the, the privileged Dalits or, or, you know, which is, by the way, very extreme mini minority, and there, and, and by the way, reservation is not an economic upliftment program, it's, it's, it's actually a social empowerment program. And when it comes to social empowerment, we still have discrimination persisting in the society. That aside... Now, you're not answering my question. My I'm, question is very simple. Why should your son get into a top educational institute just because he's Dalit? And, and that's what I'm saying. We should do, and a serious survey should be done, how many privileged Dalits, and, and I'm telling with confidence, encourage their children to get reservation. And that's just, and I'm talking about mini minority, but the whole reservation debate is happening to this, where this section is being focused and the anti-reservation parade is focused on this, whereas the whole majority, which is still remaining, this girl that was just burnt alive, 10th grader, those sections which are desperately in need, that argument is not informing our conscience. That means we still have problems with this kind of, and, and this kind of, representation of this minor minority examples is actually becoming distortive and that's what I'm saying. The Dalit is not a monolithic whole, right? If Mayawati is doing something, I don't have to answer for her. Similarly, if a Brahmin minister is doing, do you ask Rajiv, uh, Rajdeep Sardesai, Saraswat God Brahmin, he had paraded his caste identity and congratulated Parrikar of Adni, every other Brahmin. So Rajiv, tell me what do you think about other Brahmin? Or Kamal, what do you think about belong to your caste? And I think this has become a wholesome responsibility. And where, why, and when do we become Indian is primary. Is, is that's that's a good point because a young leader like Rahul Gandhi, Palam Raju, had the option of saying, I am Indian first. Yet he chooses to say, I am a Kashmiri Pandit, I am a Dattatre uh, Brahman, and that's my Gotra. You know, he, he, Ambedkar spoke of the annihilation of caste. A young leader like Rahul Gandhi should say, I am about, I, I don't care about, I can say I don't care about caste, but I don't need any votes from anybody. But why can't Rahul Gandhi say that? Would that not be setting the right example? Would that not be empowering India's Dalits, tribals, saying here's a leader who says he doesn't believe in caste? I think you're bringing it back to the point 
from the previous debate. I've said it in the uh, in that uh, at that time also that Rahul Gandhi. You didn't like the question, then you don't Rahul like. Rahul Gandhi <laughs> has always been saying that I'm Indian first. My caste is Indian. My religion is Indian. But nobody heard it till BJP drew him to a point where he had to show his, you know, identity according to Manuspriti. Okay. But anyway, I mean, that's not that we're digressing from the point. And I think uh, Suraj is, uh, you know, has a lot of uh, pent-up frustration that things aren't happening fast enough for the larger community there than a small section of people. And I think that's an issue that we need to address. Uh, I think there's still a lot more work to be done for the downtrodden communities, for the weaker sections. And I think we are not uh, paying adequate uh, focus on that. Who? according to you, Suraj, is better for India's Dalit community? The Congress, the BJP, or a Dalit party? I think a Dalit party will be the best option because then if we have to choose, we are, we are asking to choose between the, 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 which is the lesser evil. Which is the lesser evil? Evil. Um, no, so which is the lesser evil? Evil is evil. I don't want to quantify the no, level of No, but which is relation. the lesser evil? Um, Again, if I say this, it will be an endorsement of something. I would, I would just keep it at that. No, no, I'm asking you a straight question. Which is the lesser evil, the Congress or the BJP? Depends on the time. Right now, the biggest evil for Dalit community is BJP because of all these policies that has been happening. And if you go into the time scale, 20 years ago, it was Congress. Meaning... No, we are here and now. now in the build-up to the 2019 election for India's Dalit community, which is the lesser evil? Affirmative, BJP. BJP. But then again, let me... That there is a... That there is a patent inherent upper caste bias to the world view of the BJP and the RSS would be an uh, allegation that's thrown your way. Close to 50% are cabinet ministers See. of Modi are Brahmins. How do we define that? See. Less than 4% is of the population. Rahul, I think the question was for me. Uh, while as I said, I empathize with Suraj Zanga, it's not very accurate because uh, if BJP is such a party, why would we elect a president of the country today who is the biggest Dalit face okay. in the entire country? It's not tokenism. To it's not tokenism, number one. Number two… No, one, uh, one second. Wait a minute. That, that's, that's a good Ra point. Let, Let me respond. We're having a debate. One second. They made a Dalit a president, showing that at the highest position in this country, they're willing to make the effort. They didn't put a Nagpur Brahman. They put a Dalit. And we are still the enemy according to Suraj. And what happens? By the way, this was again the highest of tokenization where Mira Kumar was again proposed. This whole Dalit tokenization was at its par to the top post. And what happens to the Honorable Prior President when he visits one of the temples in Orissa? Rahul, can I say? He's been booed out. A president of India cannot even worship in the sanctimonious space of a temple. We, we don't know if that the happened. First the first thing. One, one Come second. on, the reports, the, pres the reports can say. In, Rahul. Don't one, one second. Harvard fellows shouldn't be peddling fake news. The president's office denied any such thing happened. We did a fact check on it. The president's office denied that he was booed at Puri. Rahul, what is remarkable is Suraj did not even say thank you. He did not even say that I acknowledge that the president is a Dalit and you know, it, it has you happened actually. You thank him for making not a even Dalit president. He did not even acknowledge. Listen to his counter. We need a Dalit who will speak to the cause of the most oppressed, most poor working class person. We don't need a tokenized Dalit to be represented and slapped so on the president of India is a we token? We need a Dalit who will usher the voice of the most depressed from the community, who will give a statement when Sujali is been burnt alive two days ago, who will take a statement stand against this very Brahminical system that he's been copting into. If that is the Dalit we put into, my first thanks See, goes to him. Uh, Rahul, the hypocrisy here, and the double talk here is, on one end he says he wants to end casteism. And the other, he continues to protect his clan. And he wants to be completely uh, no, isolated from the mainstream. But that's a very upper caste way of looking at it. He just told you, don't think of Dalits as a monolith. Look at the number of castes, communities, sub-castes involved. And when you say he wants to protect his clan, you are guilty of exactly what Suraj has been no, accusing I'm you of. No, I'm not. Because I'm saying... When you asked him whether it's BJP or Congress or a Dalit party, what did he say? Why I'm saying it is, when your macro identity is Indian and when you want to demolish the caste, if it were for us, Rahul, I'm saying it right on this platform. If it were for us and if we have the ability to do it constitutionally, I don't know, we would ban the caste. This is BJP. We would ban the caste. 
Now let him say that once the band the cast then he would say that all of us are together you know, krishna sagar now be careful about what you say I'm saying because it. the last person who said it was I'm mohan bhagwat and we saw what happened in the bihar election after that this is bjp bjp believes the macro identity is indian everything else is subsidiary to us and everything else we believe congress has marginalized on it capitalized on it made it into vote banks created walls and ensured that they have these people vote for them but they have they have divided and disempowered we are uniting and empowering people yes, that is so why if it is left to us we would ban the caste ban the caste so begin with the priests who by default by the very virtue of them being brahmin become the priest why don't we have a regulatory authority on that second thing now modi's cabinet has close to 50% brahmin cabinet ministers why don't the bjp say next cabinet will be 50% dalit or adivasi together if this is something that we don't choose politics, our ministers on the basis of caste mr suraj you do that's why maybe 50% you didn't come to india very often brahmins. we choose our ministers on the basis of competence we also remove that ministers means dalits are on the basis of their competence you that know, means dalits are incompetent we are running out of time on this uh, program it's very interesting to have a young fresh dalit voice come and speak to us in the manner that you have but what's with the hair <laughs> yeah. and, and i think rahul mistook him as a rapper <laughs> a phd scholar <laughs> i think this is a new dalit for you the dalit that you are used to view and see and observe which is caricatured in your mind which is someone who is struggling who is your beggar who is trying to clean your toilets who is trying to clean your utensils your help your mate new dalit is educated is aware is conscious about his identity and very proud can stand in middle of the crowd and say yes i am a dalit and i'll fight for my community until the last person of the person who has oppressed my community is liberated we are we are proud to have suraj here we are very proud to have you here on this the panel this has been a fantastic conversation i'm sure all of you have enjoyed this as well can we have a very warm round of applause for suraj yengde krishna sagar rao and pallam raju thank you gentlemen thank you